Good afternoon. First, I would like to thank the audience. I will do the review. Being with us at the last session of today. Our last session today is implementing and monitoring water-related SDGs in turbulent times and areas. Before we start, I would like to introduce our distinguished panelists to you. And I would like to thank them once again for accepting our invitation to be with us in this important issue. I also want to make a uh, note for all of you. We are using Twitter to send the messages outside. So the messages we are talking here should be shared with the rest of the world. If you use the hashtag water and peace on your Twitter accounts, we will be very pleased. Our SUEN team is doing this, but as if the audience can also uh, join us in doing that, uh, we will give our messages to the out. Our first panelist is my dear friend, Birgila Mizana from United uh, Nations Environmental Program. Uh, we have Stefan Ulenbrook. He is the coordinator and director in the UN World Water Assessment Program. Delphine Clerol is from OECD, Water Governance Program. I have the chance to cooperate with her as Suen is also a member of Water Governance Initiative of OECD. Uh, Sema Bezit from Turkey. She is the head of development and research center in the Ministry of Development. And I have the honor to introduce Professor Jumali Kınacı. I was one of his students in Istanbul Technical University. When we were setting out the program for this water forum under the main title of Water and Peace, we thought that it would be important to also tackle the issue of sustainable development goals. Because uh, in recent years, in all our countries, we are trying to make our actions, make our projects based on these sustainable development goals. This is always in our agenda. So in this panel, we will be discussing what are the gaps, challenges, and recommendations for the universal applicability and monitoring of SDGs? How good are we doing that in general context? And additionally, we will try to look at the relationship between migration, prob migration related problems and in turbulent times, how we are successful to apply these SDGs. As we are in, of course, water forum, of course, Goal number six, water-related goal, will be in our target. And we will be tackling about how the migration-related goals also uh, can be incorporated uh, with uh, water-related goals. We are hoping that we can have some recommendations and roadmap for incorporating the migrants, refugees, displaced persons, or persons affected by conflict and uh, co occupation into related SDG strategies. Of course, we will consider this the situation first in the hosting countries, where it is the country of destination. Uh, we have the issue to be tackled in the refugee camps or transition areas. And of course, in the crisis zones and also in the post-war period, how will these SDGs will be implemented? So in the first round of this panel, I would like to ask each of our panelists to discuss the universal applicability of SDGs, how we are successful or unsuccessful on implementation of the SDGs, and how can we increase its applicability? And also, are we able to monitor them in details? What can be done to increase the success rate for in achieving the targets. We can go by order this time. Birgi, please. Okay, thank you very much. Afternoon, and thank you for being here. 
at this late moment, as uh, Ashley Ann said. Um, this is a very relevant question, Ashley Ann, because um, at the end of 2015, I think two important frameworks came into um, life. Let's say the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goal, and uh, leading to the 2013 agenda, as well as uh, the Paris Declaration. So the fact that uh, the SDGs, in contrary to the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goal, is really addressing the whole world, not only making a difference between developed and developing countries, and that all the countries agreed, they really uh, signed it, they adopted it, and also they set some kind of framework to see how they can implement it. Um, I think this makes already a kind of successful uh, step and move toward implementing them. We know that uh, the 17 goals which has been ab adopted has also comes with challenges. Challenges because we need also to think and see how we could continue implementing or finishing the unfinished business from the Millennium Development Goal. And uh, by doing that, meanwhile also tackling the coming challenges. And in these coming challenges, uh, what we, have, we are seeing now is like the, this conflict, uh, the refugees, uh, the migrants, the old geopolitical world have been changing and you need to uh, implement what is out there as a context, but being flexible enough to incorporate what is coming up. And um, the world and most of the, the countries, because uh, these SDGs, even if they say it's adopted by UN, UN is the countries, um, they make the commitment. And um, um, I, I, I, I believe that they, everyone and each country who sign it and uh, made the commitment is very kind of um, pledging and serious about implementing it, serious about getting it done, because we know that this is a framework which really, from hunger to water to gender to education to health to cooperation to partnership, it has looked at the world, what is really need to be there to make it uh, success, uh, successful. And um, so challenges is there, but hope also is there. Commitment is there, and um, the political will has been shown. Now, let me give two examples of how, for example, at the UN environment, we are trying to work in helping um, the implementation, because at the end, it's the countries who have, we are responsible for that. And at the UN, we are just the impulse servant to see how we could best um, help the countries based on their need and on their demand. I will take two goals, which we are right now, like worked uh, from, from uh, almost two years now. The SDG 6, as I'm, uh, you mentioned earlier on, uh, together with uh, some sister agencies, we feed the uh, UN, uh, UN environment, um, talk UNESCO and about WSO, uh, other UN agencies, which I want to know them all here. We try to come up on uh, how we could best uh, set up a kind of global uh, enhanced monitoring initiative, because we know that uh, if we want to make the path and move forward, we need to see what is the baseline? Are, are, are we really uh, moving in the right direction? So we need to monitor what we are implementing. So in the case of the goal six, for example, we came up with uh, once the indicators and targets has been adopted, what is the, the monitoring mechanism which could be uh, put in place? And working with the countries, come up with uh, some agenda based on the existence because it's it doesn't make sense to come up with a new framework, new uh, way of doing things, and forgetting what is already in place. You need to build on what is existing, strengthen the structure which is in place, working with the statistical commissions in each country to see what is lacking, what are they doing already which is good to build on that, and then move from that. For goal six, this is already what we have done, and. Uh, still on doing because um, 
the, let's say, the, the framework of monitoring is out there, but it needs now to be rolled out to the countries and see what is the response, what is the gaps which can be filled. In the case of, uh, I took again, we were working on oceans, goal 14. This also, there has been working group with the countries to see what is the best to see, what is the, the way of uh, looking at the targets and how to really help monitoring. In June, just uh, um, one week or two weeks from now, there will be a big conference on the ocean, and it will be looking at how best to um, set the scene of uh, monitoring and uh, try, uh, starting to implement uh, Goal 14, which is on uh, life on ocean. So um, to sum up, I will say that the framework is a good start. It's a good framework. The countries has committed. Challenges is there because we'll need means and financial um, mechanism to really implement it. But the fact that all the countries is behind it, that they are uh, this uh, move on let make it uh, happen, I think I'm really optimistic that we can make it and uh, monitor it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So we have the framework. Everything is ready to start, but the monitoring stage is just rolling, so we need some time. How is UNESCO and UN Water is looking at this issue, Stefan? Uh, thank, thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. Well, how is UNESCO and UN Water looking at that? Well, and very good things have been said by Bigo just now, you know. Uh, I think one, some of the lessons learned from the Millennium Development Goals period is that it's good to have nice goals, but it's also good to actually think from the beginning how we're going to achieve them. What are the kind of management options that we have? And we cannot manage what we don't measure. So therefore, I think from the beginning, more emphasis has been given on, on defining a performance management system with indicators that help us to, to get some insights. So where are we? You know, what, what do we need to, to do and which objectives we want to reach? I think there, there's quite some there's additional thinking. Well. I don't share your complete optimism that everything is in place and just a question of collecting some data, you know. Uh, um, b before I, I explain that, uh, let me say that um, I, I think another lesson learned from the NDG period is that it's not a UN-led system. It's really a country-led system. So the countries are in charge and they lead. And we from the UN, we are there to assist and, and support and, and help us with uh, developing methodologies, help with uh, collecting data and, and you know, ma make that kind of technically sound together with, with the statistical offices and other experts. But um, having said this, um, the indicators were defined in different tiers. You know, tier one is mean data is there, methodology is there, clear, ready to go. Uh, and then the other extreme is maybe tier three means that actually we, we don't really have a proper methodology or, or if we have one, we still need to actually work with them and find out how does it look in practice. And, and tier two is Methodology is there, but data need to be collected. But quite a number of the indicators are still in the tier three. That means we, we still have to do methodological, conceptual work to actually have an indicator to, to measure what we want to measure. Um, when it comes to the water goal, there, there is certainly good progress. There's the, um, uh, a, a performance management system has been developed. There's different uh, UN agencies supporting the member states with the data collection for the the 6.1 and 6.2, the more WASH-oriented uh, targets, if I may say so. There, there is a, a joint monitoring program led by UNICEF and WHO in place to, to kind of further uh, measure that, and a lot of experiences from the MDG period is there. When it comes to the, to the newer indicator, new I mean indicators that they have been not considered at all in the MDG period. These are indicators about water resources, about integrated water resources management, about transboundary water management, ecosystems, etc. Their indicators have been proposed and decided on, and, and the uh, proof of concept has been done, and the rollout to, to quite a number of countries is, is ongoing as, as we speak. So, so it's a kind of work in progress. If I may, one more uh, additional aspect. Um, what, what will happen, you know, that the, the HLPF, that's the high, um, high level political forum, is always investigating a couple of goals per year. And in 2018, SDG 6, the water goal, will be one of the, the goals that they have an in-depth look at. And um, there's a 11 indicators, we know 6.1 and 2 and 6.3 and 6.3A and 6.3B and so on and so on. And 
what will happen that the, the UN will produce a lot of reports on this, and this is what we like at the UN. Not, not necessarily we like, we have to do it as well, you know. But, you know, it, a plethora of reports is not necessarily increasing the political impact, you know. Therefore, we, we set a target at, at UN Water to, uh, instead of, well, in addition to have the, the, the target-specific indicators, which are very important, um, to also have a so-called synthesis report on SDG 6. That's a report where we try to synthesize uh, where are we with SDG 6, and what are the key policy recommendations that we would like to offer the member states in, in how to accelerate SDG 6. That synthesis report we, we develop as we speak, and it will come out in a year from now, and that will be then given to the HLPF for, for their deliberations in summer 2018 to, to assess uh, what, where are we with SDG 6 and how to, how to do that. And I would like to, to, you know, sometimes the UN, UN rightfully is, is uh, criticized, being fragmented, and some work is double, done double, some work is not done, and whatever, whatever, and, and, and probably there are two aspects to it, but, but when it comes to the synthesis report, I would like to stress that this is really a collaboration between all the UN agencies, so um, delivering as one and trying together to deliver this, this one synthesis report, and all the custodian agencies um, is, um, is producing this report. I, I happen to coordinate this, this task on behalf of UN Water, but, but it's, it's really not only UNESCO, it's really the collaboration with all the other partners. I think we have in total 11 agencies contributing to the synthesis report, and it's an exciting, an exciting exercise to, to, to do this. Uh, I definitely believe that such a synthesis report will be helpful for the countries, because countries are dealing with several UN organizations on this issue. So sometimes it is a little bit complex for them to identify which agency to talk to on which SDG. So a collaborative effort of all the UN agencies is, I think, uh, is necessary and will be helpful. Now if I can turn to OECD, in not only for water but for the application of general SDGs, how is OECD supporting the countries? Yeah. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Um, I just want to, to start uh, by maybe mentioning or clarifying for those of you that do not know what the OECD is. Um, we're the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Uh, we bring together 35 countries that are the most developed uh, economies, and Turkey is, is one of uh, our member countries. Um, and I, I, I uh, take the time to clarify this so you understand also the, the perspective from which I, I speak. And, and that you understand that actually the SDGs have um, made uh, a major shift for these uh, countries, OECD member countries, uh, uh, compared to what we had before. Uh, because the MDGs uh, were actually not universal goals. Uh, they applied for... Uh, to developing countries, um, but this time around, the SDGs are not only broad and ambitious, but they're universal. So that means that even developed uh, countries have to, um, have to uh, work on uh, uh, bringing them into their national strategies and monitoring progress. Um, so some of the challenges that we see the countries face today when it comes to actually integrating uh, the, the 17 goals has to do with uh, addressing the legacies of the economic crisis uh, and, and doing so in, in times of fiscal consolidation. Uh, it's also um, a matter of more and more we move away from uh, an, the narrative of development uh, as being only uh, uh, economic measures, but we also look at the broader uh, spectrum of well-being and sustainable development, and, and OECD countries also have to address these, um, these issues. Um, and they also have, but I guess this is a challenge that is faced by more than only OECD countries, they have, it, they have to deal with the integrative nature of uh, the SDGs, because the 17 goals are meant as a very holistic uh, framework, uh, whereas governments tend to be uh, sectorally organized. And so this uh, tends to be a challenge when it comes to dealing with the different uh, policy issues covered by the SDGs. So to answer your question as to what the OECD has been doing since the adoption of the SDGs two years ago, um, I want to highlight um, two, two points. The first one is that uh, very shortly after the adoption of the SDGs, uh, OECD countries uh, agreed to develop what we called an action plan, uh, an OECD-wide action plan, 
um, that basically aims to do three things. First is to provide a policy forum, meaning uh, a space where governments uh, from OECD countries can come, share their challenges and their good practices when it comes to implementing the SDGs. Second is to provide standards and policy evidence on the different topics covered by the SDGs. Um, and um, third is uh, to also encourage policy coherence, uh, exactly to address the challenge I just mentioned, which has to do with how to address the SDGs in an integrated way. Um, and the second thing we've been doing uh, is uh, a study, a pilot study that was published by the OECD a year ago, um, entitled Measuring the Targets. Um, and this study is, is not meant to be a, a, a monitoring study of, of the SDGs because we're, it's, it's very early on in the process. But what it does is that it's a stock-taking exercise. Um, so the OECD is an organization that collects a lot of data. And so the objective of this study is to look at what we know and meaning uh, try to uh, define the starting positions of OECD member countries. Based on the indicators and the data that we have at hand, where do countries stand when it comes to the SDGs on ocean, the SDGs on health, the SDGs on hunger, etc., etc., so that countries can have an idea of where they're starting from, um, and and it also allows us to, as an organization, to uh, take stock of where do we have data already available and where do we not, so that in the future we can also focus uh, our efforts on, uh, on areas where statistical development um, is, uh, is particularly needed. Um, and this, this broad action plan uh, trickles down into specific activities that we're carrying out on water, but I will touch uh, on these a bit later in the panel when we zoom in on SDG 6. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Bayezid, I know that you have been following up the SDGs from the beginning. While at the UN level, when they were uh, decided, you were following up the process. Now, I want to ask you, uh, how is Turkey uh, doing in that for adapting the SDGs? Uh, what are the problems we are facing? How we are monitoring its adaptation? Uh, what are your experience on uh, this? Teşekkür ederim. Ee, müsaadeniz olursa Türkçe e, konuşmak istiyorum. E, ben de e, Su Enstitüsü'ne, e, Orman Su İşleri Bakanlığı ve DSI'ye e, bu davetler için teşekkür ederek başlamak istiyorum. E, şimdi e, biz Kalkınma Bakanlığı olarak e, Türkiye'de e, sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedeflerinin e, Birleşmiş Milletler'de e, tartışılmaya başladığı ilk günden itibaren sürecin içinde olmaya ve katkı vermeye çalıştık. Sizin ilk baştaki sorunuzdan başlamak isterim müsaadenizle. E, sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedeflerinin e, evrensel uygulanabilirliği var mıdırın cevabı? E, yani biraz yoktur gibi. Çünkü bu bir evrensel e, ajanda. Yani ee, aslında küresel sorunların hepsini içine alan bir ajanda. Yeni bir ajanda değil. Baktığınız zaman 130, 169 tane hedef var. Ee, bunlar birçok sektörleri kesiyor. Ee, bunların içinden ilham alarak e, uygulama yapmak mümkün. Ee, fakat bunların e, içinde çok yeni olan şeyler de yok. Aslında birçoğumuzun ülkelerimizde veya uluslararası örgütlerin çatısı altında kabul ettiği, yapmaya gayret ettiği hedefler var. Bu yeni bir paket, iyi bir paket, çok kapsamlı ve ülkelere önümüzdeki e, 20 yılda aslında e, iyi bir e, yol haritası vermiş durumda e, sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefleri. Ama şöyle bir avantajı var bu hedeflerin. E, benden önceki konuşmacılar bahsetti. E, tüm dünya bir bin yıl kalkınma hedeflerini çalıştı 15 yıl boyunca. Ve bu hedefleri çalışırken de belli kazanımlar elde etti. E, şunu demek istiyorum, tecrübesiz değiliz. Yani e, hepimiz hem uluslararası örgütler, sivil toplum kuruluşları, bütün taraflar, hükümetler e, bu ajandayı bence çok hızlı kendi gündemlerine taşıyarak e, uygulama noktasına geçebilecek durumdalar. E, tabii ki e, ihtiyaçlar olacaktır e, ki bu zaten e, hedeflerin içinde söyleniyor. 
Ama e, buradaki en önemli kritik nokta uygulama araçları. Yani dünyanın elinde ya da ülkelerin elinde zaten çok güçlü e, politika çerçeveleri var. E, burada kritik soru e, bence e, bunun uygulama araçlarını nasıl geliştireceğiz? E, çünkü yapılacak şeyler aşağı yukarı belli ama işte mesela izleme konusu evet e, 250'ye yakın göstergeden bahsediliyor. Bunların bir kısmı hali hazırda toplanıyor. Bir kısmının nasıl toplanacağını biliyoruz ama toplayamıyoruz. Bir kısmında hiçbir bilgimiz yok. Yani metodolojisi bile belli değil. Dolayısıyla mesela burada birçok ülkenin bizim ülkemize dahil kapasite geliştirme ihtiyaçları olacaktır. Şimdi buradaki bu gündemin uygulanmasındaki en kritik nokta bana göre bir tanesi uygulama araçları. Bir tanesi de e, ortaklıkların geliştirilmesi. Belki bunu ilerleyen e, rantlarda daha rahat tartışırız. Biz ne yapıyoruz Türkiye olarak? E, tabii e, bütün o tartışma süreçlerinin içinde olmak bize şöyle bir avantaj verdi. E, Kalkınma Bakanlığı Türkiye'de e, politika e, geliştirilmesinde hükümetlere danışmanlık yapan bir kurum. E, dolayısıyla da ülkenin kalkınma gündemini zaten çok yakından takip eden bir kurum ve bin yıl kalkınma hedeflerini de e, benzer şekilde e, izlemişti. Bunun verdiği avantajla biz e, birazcık daha konforlu bir şekilde bu hedefleri e, müzakere edebildik. Hedefler büyük ölçüde Türkiye'nin kalkınma öncelikleriyle uyumlu hedefler. O yüzden bir avantajımız var ama tabii bizim de uygulama zorluklarımız var. E, bu noktada e, izleme konusu çok e, zor bir konu. E, bu hedefler tartışılırken e, aslında e, veri e, devrimi, data revolution'dan da bahsedilmişti e, bolca. Ama bunun içinde ülkeler ve e, uluslararası örgütler arı gibi çalışıyorlar. E, biz de çalışıyoruz. Yani bizim de e, istatistik kurumumuz zaten sürdürülebilir kalkınma göstergelerini izleyen bir kurumdu. Bu konuda deneyimleri var. Bu deneyimlerini önümüzdeki yıllara yayacaktır diye düşünüyorum. Daha çok başındayız her şeyin. Yarın da zannediyorum bizim bakanlığımızın bir yan etkinliği olacak bununla ilgili. Ama bu çok iyi bir ajandadır. Su bunların içinde bizim de öncelikli bir alanımızdır. Ee, yani baktığımız zaman e, suyun önceliğini e, ülke için e, görmemek mümkün değil. E, bu konudaki gözlemlerimi de daha sonraki şeyde e, turda e, paylaşabilirim. Aslında bir devam niteliğinde Sema Hanım'a bir soru daha ileteyim ben burada. Bildiğim kadarıyla Rio konferansı, 92 Rio konferansından sonra 96'da Türkiye sürdürülebilir kalkınmadan e, kalkınma planlarında bahsetmeye başladı ve bunları dahil etti. Evet. Ve şu anda 11. kalkınma planlarının hazırlanma aşamasındayız. Evet. Bu sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefleri Türkiye kalkınma planlarına ne şekilde yansıyor? Şöyle, biz bakanlık içinde plan hazırlık çalışmalarını, yani ilk çalışmaları başlattık. Planların kendine özgü bir hazırlık süreci vardır. Biz bunları katılımcı süreçlerle hazırlıyoruz, komisyonlar oluşturuyoruz, tüm tarafların yer aldığı. Bu komisyonlarla yürütüyoruz hazırlık sürecini. Tabii bütün uluslararası dokümanlar Türkiye'nin imza attığı veya atmadığı bu süreçte küresel gelişmeler bizim önemli rehberlerimizdir. Yani sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefleri de çok önemli bir çerçeve koyuyor bizim önümüze. E, bu da e, referans dokümanlardan bir tanesi olacaktır. E, bunun için de e, bakanlık içindeki müzakerelerimizde e, yöntem konusunda e, çalışmalar yapılıyor. Ayrı bir birim de bunun için özel olarak gayret sarf ediyor. Thank you very much. Uh, Profesör Kınacı, your institution is responsible for water management in Turkey in general. But in your projects, in your activities, uh, what are the challenges you are facing for applying and adopting SDGs? Is, how do you take uh, SDGs into your agenda, in your activities? 
Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I want to speak in Turkish. Okay. Uh, ben de öncelikle herkese iyi uh, akşamlar demeyeceğim ama uh, öğleden sonra da ırı diyeyim uh, diyerek başlamak istiyorum. Biraz uh, konuyu uh, geniş perspektiften almak istiyorum. Konu başlığı sürdürülebilir kalkınma. Bir, iki sorunlu zamanlar ve sorunlu bölgeler. Sürdürülebilir kalkınma biliyorsunuz e, kalkınma hedeflerinin doğal kaynaklarını e, kaynakları tabi bu arada bir doğal kaynak olan suyu e, geri dönmemez şekilde tahrip etmeden kirletmeden e, gerçekleştirmek e, bunun gerçekleştirebilmesi için de bir takım planlar yapılıyor e, uygulama planları planlar uygulanıyor uygulamalar izleniyor. Ancak ben başlangıçta belki en sonunda söylemem gerekiyor. Bu genellikle gelişmekte olan ve orta gelişme düzeyinde ülkelerde bu tip çalışmaların, uluslararası kuruluşlar tarafından yapılan çalışmaların çok yavaş ilerlediği konusunda bir kanı var. Öncelikle bunu buradaki Sayın Birleşmiş Milletler, UNESCO ve OECD temsilcilerine belirtmek istiyorum. Ee, peki sorun nedir? Sorun şu andaki gündemimizin konusu. Sorun e, suyun temini. Sorunlu zaman nedir? Sorunlu zaman olarak neyi tanımlıyoruz? Aslında sorunlu zamanı belki ikiye ayırmak gerekiyor. Bir yavaş isteyen süreçler bir de ani gelişen süreçler. Yavaş gelişen süreçlere bakacak olursak aslında yeryüzü e, ilk e, ortaya çıktığından beri devam eden bir değişim, dönüşüm süreci var. Bir iklim değişikliği süreci var. Doğal olarak kendiliğinden meydana gelen. Bu yavaş e, geliştiği için etkisi kısa sürede hissedilmedi. Ama ne zaman e, 1800'lü yıllardan itibaren sanayileşme başlayınca insan etkisi çok daha belirgin bir şekilde hissedilir oldu. Biliyorsunuz büyük petrol yatakları büyük ölçüde e, şu anda kurak olan bölgelerde, çöllerde. Buralarda demek ki daha önceki yıllarda, bin yıllarda çok gür ormanlar vardı ve bunlar toprak altında kaldılar. Ve bunda e, burada daha sonra iklim tamamen değişti. Bu değişim sonucu orada yaşayan insanlar daha rahat yaşayabilecekleri bölgelere göçtüler. Yani temel sebep aslında göçlerin su. Ee, i̇nsanların bir kısmı da hızlı kentleşmeden dolayı yani daha iyi hayat standartına ulaşabileceği bir yere e, gitmek istiyor. Gitmek istemesinin en büyük sebepleri de hayat standartını daha yüksek tutmak. Daha yüksek tutabilmek için e, daha fazla doğal kaynak olması gerekiyor. Doğal kaynakların olabilmesi için de su gerekiyor. Yine sonuçta suya her şey suya suyla ilişkili. Gıda da suyla ilişkili. Su almadan gıda olmuyor. Enerji de büyük ölçüde suyun payı var. Dolayısıyla bütün göçlerin hızlı değil de yavaş devam eden göçlerin temelinde su kıtlığı var. Bir de hızlı bir dönüşüm var. Nedir bu? Savaşlar sonucu insanların Güvenlik dolayısıyla hızlı bir şekilde yer değiştirmeye ihtiyacı. Şu anda e, Orta Doğu'da, Suriye'de ve e, Irak'ta meydana gelen olaylar. Bu olaylarda kısa sürede insanlar can güvenliği dolayısıyla hızlı bir şekilde yer değiştiriyorlar. Bu değiştirme sonucu da çok acil ve önemli hızlı problemler ortaya çıkıyor. Bu problemleri çözebilmek aslında yavaş ilerleyen süreçlere göre çok daha zor. Çünkü ani hızlı yerleşim alanları teşkil edeceksiniz. Onların altyapı tesislerini kuracaksınız. Ve insanları orada insani e, seviyede e, medeni bir şekilde yaşamalarını sağlayacak altyapıda yaşatacaksınız. Bu kolay değil. Hem e, zamanla yarışıyorsunuz hem finansman hızlı şekilde finansman sağlamanız gerekiyor. E, Türkiye'de şu anda sadece e, Suriye göçü dolayısıyla 3,5 milyon göçmen var. Bunun dışında da e, Suriye'den, Suriye'nin dışında gelen e, göçmenler var. E, toplam e, göçmen sayısı aslında 4 milyonun üzerinde. 
Afrika'dan, Irak'tan vesaire gelen göçmenler var. Bunların da e, hızlı bir şekilde altyapı ihtiyaçlarının karşılanması gerekiyor. E, bunlar da e, en büyük sorun e, suyun temini hızlı bir şekilde, sağlıklı bir şekilde insanlara ulaştırılması ve ortaya çıkan e, kirli suyun insan sağlığını olumsuz etkilemeyecek şekilde uzaklaştırılması. Bu e, önemli bir problem. E, bununla ilgili e, daha sonraki süreçlerde geniş e, bilgi vermek istiyorum eğer e, zaman kalırsa. Ama bu arada birkaç hususu daha vurgulamak istiyorum. Şimdi dünyada baktığımız zaman su dağılımı, e, su aslında yer kürede fazla ama tuzlu su. Bir, e, tatlı su az, hele hele insanların e, ulaşabildiği miktar daha az. E, buna e, insanların ulaşabilmesi için de göç söz konusu. Yani bir yerde, bazı yerlerde de tam tersine suyun fazlalığıyla mücadele ediliyor. Dolayısıyla şeyler de farklı, öncelikler de farklı. Ee, Kuzey e, Amerika'da e, ve Güney Amerika'nın, yani ekvatordan e, yukarıla kutuplara doğru gittikçe e, su fazlalığı başlıyor. Ama e, ekvatora doğru yaklaştıkça, orta kuşağa gelince su kıtlığı başlıyor. O zaman... E, uluslararası kuralları belirleyen ülkeler de öncelikli olarak kendi ihtiyaçlarını öne çıkarıyorlar. Avrupa Birliği'nin bir e, taşkın direktifi var. Ama kuraklık direktifi, direktifi yok. E, yani bu en e, önemli e, vereceğim örneklerden birisi. İklim değişikliğinin su kaynaklarına etkisi e, e, her ne kadar yavaş bir süreçse de son yıllarda artmaya başladı. Bu konuda e, Birleşmiş Milletler ve diğer uluslararası kuruluşların faaliyetleri sürüyor. E, bu faaliyetlerin ya, geriye dönüşü konusunda e, daha aktif olunması gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Bir takım kararlar alınıyor ama bu kararlar e, izlenirken ne kadar sağlıklı geri dönüşler oluyor o konuda e, tereddütler, soru işaretler var. Onu burada özellikle vurgulamak istiyorum. Medeni, e, genellikle şeye baktığımız zaman tarihe, insanlık tarihine, e, uygarlığın ilk geliştiği bölgelerin orta kuşaklı olduğunu görüyoruz. Akdeniz Havzası, Orta Doğu, yani Kuzey e, ve e, Kuzey Afrika, Güney Avrupa, yani Akdeniz bölgesi, Orta Doğu, Çin gibi ülkelerden meydana gelmiş. Fakat şu anda oralarda su kıtlığı başladığı için, İnsanlar daha kuzeye gitmek istiyorlar. Ee, Akdeniz'de boğulan binlerce insanı e, biliyorsunuz, hepimiz yaşıyoruz, görüyoruz. E, bunun e, temelinde aslında su kıtlığı var. O zaman bizim çözüm olarak düşüneceğimiz husus nedir başlangıçta? Öncelikle o insanları o bölgelerde, yaşadıkları bölgelerde isyan etmeden. Bunun yolu da öncelikle oraya sağlıklı içme suyu ve sanitasyon hizmeti getirmekten e, geçiyor. Bunu sağlayabilmek için de eğitim, plan, program, bunlar da yıllar kaybediyoruz. Ve sonuç alınmıyor. Oradaki insanların da bu plan, eğitim vesaireye güveni yok. Ee, i̇nsanlar bir takım yatırım görmek istiyor ve kısa sürede sonuç almak istiyorlar. Bunu görmek istiyorlar. Eğer siz e, oraya sağlıklı içme suyunu getirirseniz, e, bir uluslararası fonla bunu sağlamak mümkün aslında. Onu yaparsanız o insanlar başka bir ülkeye geçmek istemez, göçmek istemez. E, can pahasına e, öleceğini bile bile Akdeniz'de boğulacağını bile bile kimse e, yer değiştirmek istemez. Sınırlarda karşılaştığı e, in, gayri insani e, davranışlarla karşılaşmak istemez. Ama buna rağmen insanlar bütün bu güçlükleri e, dikkate alarak göçmek istiyor. O zaman ne yapacağız? Bizim fon oluşturmamız gerekiyor. Uluslararası bir fon. Bu fona gelişmiş ülkelerin daha fazla e, katkı vermeleri gerekiyor. Türkiye şu anda 4 e, milyondan fazla e, göçmen e, isyan ettiriyor. Bunları kabaca bir hesap yapacak olursak e, su kayıpları dahil kişi başına 250 litre su e, temin edileceğini düşünecek olursak günde yaklaşık 1 milyon metreküp su getiriyor. Ilave su getirmesi gerekiyor Türkiye'nin. Bunu yaptı Türkiye, sağladı. 
Aynı zamanda atık sularında insan sağlığına insan sağlığını olumsuz etkilemeyecek şekilde uzaklaştırılması gerekiyor. Kabaca bu iki eylemin yani hem su temini hem de atık su uzaklaştırmanın bir metreküpünün bedelini bir dolar alsak Türkiye günde yaklaşık bir milyon dolar günde su ve atık su için para harcıyor. Bunu Türkiye karşılayabiliyor. Türkiye'de gayri safi milli asıla kişi başına düşen değer 10 bin dolar civarında. Halbuki 40 bin dolar civarında milli gelir olan çok sayıda ülkeler var. Zengin çok. Bu ülkeleri 40 bin dolar yerine 39 bin dolara düşürecek şekilde ona katkı vermeleri bu problemi çözer diye düşünüyorum. Birinci aşamada söylemek istediğim sonuç olarak bir uluslararası su fonunun kurulması ve doğrudan yatırma oradaki insanları göçü önleyecek şekilde yatırma yönelik olarak harcanması gerektiğini söylemek istiyorum. Thank you very much. Uh, so you not only define the case but thank you for giving us concrete action points that countries can cooperate and start working on that. Actually with your speech uh, you have moved us into the migration issue directly. So in the first round we basically talked about SDGs in general and now it's time for us to think about these SDGs in the focus of migration. Uh, international migration have been in the UN summits for decades but as you know in uh, Millennium Development Goals it was not included. With the uh, Declaration of 2030 Agenda, now it calls on member states to strengthen international cooperation to ensure safe, orderly and regular migration with full respect for human rights for migrants, refugees and internally displaced persons. Therefore, concrete measures are captured under specific goal of 17 and also goals 3, 4, 5, 8, 10 and 16 also directly addresses the issue of migration in its targets. Total of, uh, there are, as you know, 169 targets in 17 goals. Out of these 169 targets, 10 are directly related with migration. It seems that this migration issue will be continuing uh, in the upcoming years because especially in the past 15 years, the number has increased drastically. Not only in this region, but if you look at the figures globally, uh, according to a UN report, there are 244 million migrants at the moment globally. So this is not an only problem of this region, but globally it's a growing uh, issue. Now, uh, my question is, what are the required tools to adapt SDGs to these unforeseen conflicts? Yes, we are having the SDGs in our normal, uh, trying to uh, have them in normal operation of the countries, but what happens if there is a crisis case, like migration or, uh, or there is a war? How will be handling these SDGs, or how will the SDGs will help us solve the problems during these conflicted zones? conflicted periods. This is a general question to my panel, uh, who we can share our ideas briefly. Birgi, you can start. Yeah, thank you. I think that this is very relevant nowadays, um, where in each part of the globe we have some emergencies. It could be war, could be conflict, but it could be also um, general uh, events like flood, drought, which lead to emergencies. And when we talked about emergencies, um, and we want to cope with that, we need to be flexible. Flexible with the framework we have, because when you look at the SDGs, looking at all the issues together, uh, let take, um, if you have a migrant and you have refugees, you settle some camps to uh, host them, you provide them with shelter, with food, and um, when you put people together in an area which was normally not um, meant to be to do that, you need to see how you best um, deal with the environment, where because when it will be um, 
they will be living there, so meaning that um, you need to provide water, you need also to deal with the, the waste will be coming out of this farm. And um, the SDGs we have provide us on how to monitor in a, in, a, in, in, in a context of everything is good, but if uh, you have this crisis, then uh, you need to see what is the, the first thing to provide, how to think long, short term to solve the issue which is at the door, but also how to make it um, very relevant for the long, longer term. Uh, in most camps, like uh, if I take for example, this is not a war, but it's kind of um, extreme event. In Haiti, for example, when uh, they have uh, this uh, flooding and this uh, earthquake, what happened is uh, uh, waterborne disease, uh, which come up. Uh, you, you have um, people without Zelda, but you have also people dealing with water, polluted water, leading to some disease. So. And uh, this circle of uh, you have a polluted water, you drink it or you use it, and it's come, uh, it's worsened the health of the population. So, uh, in a, in this situation, everything needs to be done at once. And dealing it at once meaning that you need a synergy, you need a kind of uh, emerging plan, which deal with the, all the basic need of this population, and then uh, come up with. The, um, at least to help, to, to, to help the, the negative impact which will, will result in terms of disease, in terms of illness and, and, and death. So, um, yeah, it's a framework there, but um, when you are implementing, then you need what we said, a kind of uh, early warning, um, quick uh, conflict uh, or um, a disaster response because you need to be have a kind of uh, response which can face it. And um, in each situation, you don't have a, a magic solution which can be uh, applied else everywhere, because each, uh, each area or each situation comes with uh, its own um, specificity, so you need to be flexible uh, to, to adapt also to the local context and to see how to best address uh, this situation. It's why um, maybe we are not uh, talking about, but uh, it's good also to have a kind of uh, early warning system and be ready to um, prevent, if it's kind, kind of conflict, to prevent them than uh, really coming back to deal with them. But because dealing with them is sometimes more uh, difficult, uh, costly, and um, in dealing it with in a kind of an emergence than uh, if you, you able to prevent this uh, crisis, this uh, migration to happen by addressing the root cause. What is the root cause of this uh, uh, migration? What is the root cause of this conflict? I think Professor mentioned some of them because if you go back in the history, most of the population have migrated following the, the, the, the river uh, flows, following the, the path, and uh, looking for where they can be um, more a green area for them to, to stay and to sustain themselves. And um, I think the geopolitics comes here and you need really to see what can we do to prevent this uh, conflict? What, what can we do to work with the countries where the, the, the migrant or the conflict is occurring? And then it's not an easy question, it's not uh, an one or easy solution, but um, to really address the, in a sustainable way, we need to not just to um, clean downstream, but work upstream to see how we can help the, the, the problem um, up, uh, at, at, at source. It's what I wanted just to uh, plug in the hands. Thank you. So yeah, in a sense, from crisis management, we have to go to root causes, understand root causes, and do risk management and understand the cases. And uh, the question is actually, SDGs, how can it also help the countries for their preparedness for this kind of issues, emergencies? Stefan, maybe you can also elaborate a little bit on these. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I strongly believe that preventing a problem is, is usually, f just from a monetary point of view, much less costly than trying to repair it later, you know, despite all the tragedy of, of 
the people, you know, being displaced and, and all the, the, the personal, you know, tragedies and disasters people have to go through. So it's also from a, that's, but also from a cost, so prevent the problem. So the preventive action which uh, Birger called for is, is exactly the right question. How can we uh, tackle the root cause of migration? Um, the last 2016 World Water Development Report was on the topic water and jobs. And, and that was maybe a bit bizarre topic. Some people think there's a water sector that's only 1% of the, the, the uh, global workforce. No, but it, it was not only about the water sector itself. It was how water and access to water and, and related services actually fuels the economy, how this generates employment. And, and some of the, the interesting results in this report were that um, three out of four jobs globally depend on water. So it's, it's not only the water sector itself, it's agriculture, forestry, aquaculture, that's only one third of the global workforce. But if you include then other water intensive industries, uh, chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, um, mining and, and forestry and et cetera, so you add this all up, then, then you end up with, with three, out of four, uh, three out of four jobs depend on water. So that, that demonstrates already the water dependency of the economy. And the and economy means uh, also employment and jobs. And if people have a decent job, um, the likelihood that they leave to another country is much less. So how can we actually generate employment through investments in water? And when we put this report together, we, we looked at, at different numbers and, and you know, monitoring and having reliable data was, was very difficult to get. But, but you know, we, what we learned is every job in the water sector generates three to four jobs outside the water sector. Why, why is it like this? If you, for instance, invest in building a water, wastewater treatment plant, then you have people working at the wastewater treatment plant, engineers and uh, a director and uh, security guards and the secretaries, etc. Furthermore, this treatment plant has a demand. You know, they need papers and pencils and computers and, and chemicals and whatever. So that also, that demand also generates jobs outside the treatment plant. Furthermore, all these people then having a direct or indirect job because of the water investment uh, leads to uh, further induced jobs because these people have children that need to be sent to school and they need lawyers and a bakery and pizza and, and uh, Turkish restaurants and etc. So, so that means it generates further jobs. So the, every job in the water sector generates jobs outside the water sector quite significantly. That's the one point. And in, in, in the United States, we found a multiplier of 1 to 3.7. For, for other countries, it was more difficult to find reliable data. And now in terms of investment, and I really hope the, the blue fund that uh, Professor Kinachi uh, mentioned also will, will really be established because um, what the report shows that uh, every million put into the water sector, again in the United States where we found best data, generates between 10 and 22 jobs in total. You know, every million put there, you, you, you employ people. You know? for, the, for Latin America, we, we saw that that multiplier is uh, 1 million put into the water sector, classical water supply and sanitation. This 1 million generates about 100 jobs. It varies a lot between you know, less developed parts of Bolivia to more developed uh, uh, parts of Chile, so that's clear. But, but on the other hand, it still shows that a million put into the sector generates jobs. So to cut it short, um, we, we have to realize that also investments in the water sector are good for the environment, but also good for the people, because being employed is, is absolutely critical for, for also preventing the root cause of migration and, and, and good for the economy. So the, the, these are a few thoughts I want to share with you. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting linkage. I never looked at this issue from this job side, so it's interesting to uh, have this in mind as well. Yeah, I, um, I really believe that having a decent job and having yeah. the opportunity to, to support your family is that the likelihood that either from a rural area to move to the next city is much less, you know, mm -hmm. or even to leave the country. I'm not saying it's only about employment, and, and collapses of states, uh, poor governance, and insecurity, et cetera. There's many other reasons for migration. I fully realize mm -hmm. that. But, but I just want to also put that emphasis. You see, at, the, at the end, we are here at a water conference. Thank you. Uh, Delphine, I know that you have a lot of experience from uh, the field. You have been working a lot with the local authorities. So how can we uh, include the local authorities to the circle uh, to better implement SDGs, especially in the conflict zones and also in the vulnerable communities. So we can also discuss this because migration issue is something that we started to think nowadays. 
but we have been working with the vulnerable communities in different parts of the world, so OECD has experience on that. Indeed, um, I think when we, we said earlier that the, the question of implementing and monitoring the SDGs is the responsibility of country more than the UN system, I think we should not fall into the trap of thinking that when we say country, we mean national government. Uh, in fact, uh, OECD work on, on local economic development shows that it's at the subnational level that 70% of invest public investment take place and that local actors um, play a critical role when it comes to development. And I think that is, uh, is a reality for the SDGs as well. Um, and, uh, and then we, that our, our work on uh, um, of accompanying countries in, in implementing and monitoring the SDGs should also uh, uh, target specifically regional and, uh, and local um, authorities. Um, also because uh, many of the, of the topics uh, covered by the SDGs are inherently local and, and water, which is a topic that brings us together, is a pretty telling example. Uh, and that uh, many uh, uh, water strategies uh, need to take account of local realities and be as place-based as, as possible. And this is uh, uh, true as well for the SDGs. So this is why at OECD we, we strongly believe that um, uh, we should pay great attention to how global targets are actually making a difference, not only at national level, but at the subnational level um, as well. And as we talk about monitoring, uh, this has a lot to do with uh, a, a need for disaggregated data uh, that can actually document uh, regional disparities uh, and, and, and then tailor public action to local needs uh, and not stop only at, uh, at getting the national um, pictures. Um, so the way we've been uh, helping uh, local authorities in the OECD addressing SDGs and, and this issue uh, is by uh, launching quite recently a, a, an, a project on localizing the SDGs and it's exactly uh, doing what I, what I mentioned which is um, looking at what type of data indicators we have at hand uh, when it comes to uh, looking at uh, within local, strat local policy framework and local strategies about how they actually reflect uh, SDG issues. Um, but also uh, because it's really the, the OECD, I would say, core strength uh, is to provide a platform for dialogue where local leaders and mayors can meet uh, and, and speak to one another about what are, what are the challenges that they face when it comes to integrating the SDGs in their strategies and how some of them have addressed these issues so far and whether these solutions can be um, replicated elsewhere. Um, and in addition, if I, if I can zoom in to, to the, the SDG 6 uh, on, on water, we also see that uh, great attention was paid to, uh, to the role of, of the local uh, level when uh, developing the SDGs because you actually have a specific target within SDG 6 that has to do with the involvement of local community. Um, and the OECD, together with uh, UNEP, uh, is a co-custodian of, uh, of this target uh, and, and its monitoring. Uh, and we're doing so by um, developing water governance indicators. Um, and I think I will have an opportunity to, to expand a bit uh, later in the discussion what, uh, what we're doing with this. But just to mention that as part of these indicators, one has to do specifically with the question of engaging stakeholders and including at the local level. Uh, to make sure that uh, every actor uh, community uh, has an opportunity to be part of, of how uh, their, uh, their authority, their public authorities is addressing the issue of, of the SDGs. And so we hope that the data that will be collected against that indicator on stakeholder engagement will also be a contribution to, to the uh, broader monitoring efforts. So that data collection is essential for following up the SDGs, but when the case is the uh, related with migration, collecting, monitoring is a big, difficult issue. Uh, at this point, uh, I want to also include the audience to our discussion. Uh, we, can, we will do it also at the end, but are there any contributions, questions to our panelists at this point from the audience? We will be delighted to include you in the discussion. Yeah, please. If you can please introduce yourself and 
Who are you asking the question? Please mention. Hi, my name is Murray Burt from UNHCR. Just a question around SDG, SDG 6, which I know includes the concept of uh, leave no one behind. So sustainable water and sanitation for all. And so this includes uh, for refugees, displaced people, but also the fact that um, You've highlighted the issue of uh, long-term conflicts and long-term displacement, which seems to be a recurring theme, which uh, under UNHCR studies, now we find protracted situations of conflict exceeding 20 years on average. So humanitarian funding, in my mind, is not going to help uh, resolve this issue of long-term displacement. And we need to be tapping into traditional development mechanisms and the issue of uh, jobs is also key, where displaced people should have the right to work so that they can also become um, paying uh, service users the same as, as citizens. I'm just wondering uh, if any of you on the panel has some thoughts around this idea of how we can uh, be achieving SDG 6, um, particularly this last mile concept of displaced people and how we can be uh, leveraging additional financing mechanisms for that. I'm not sure exactly who on the panel is best placed to answer, but maybe uh, someone from OECD might have some ideas. Thank you very much. Actually, you helped me. Uh, we were also planning to discuss and tackle this issue, and now uh, any of our panelists who wants to talk on these uh, mechanisms Um, thank you. Well, I, I can answer on behalf of OECD. I don't know if the OECD is the best place to, uh, to address this issue um, because we, we do some uh, monitoring of, uh, of um, refugee flows and, and, and migration uh, at the OECD, uh, but, and we do work on OECD on water governance, which is the, the part of the organization that I represent. But, and, uh, and uh, I, I think uh, admitting this is, is in a way an indicator of how complex the issue is, um, the two sides of the organization have done little work uh, on the issue of uh, bridging the data we have on migration and the data we have on, on water and how this can feed into the addressing the issue of, of the SDGs. Uh, I think it's a highly um, delicate topic uh, and, uh, and that uh, there is, in our, in at least on our side, a critical um, gap of, of, of data uh, to actually provide some policy responses to our member countries about how they can do this. Um, I think the, what we've seen is that from an OECD member country, when they, when they deal with uh, migration issues, um, water is, is um, actually rarely on the top of their priority. Uh, it has more to do with labor, and I think it, uh, it echoes what Stefan has been doing, and with housing. Um, but we hope in the future that, uh, that water can actually uh, be a bit higher in their agenda when, it, when it's uh, a matter of discussing uh, the integration of, of uh, migrants and long-term uh, displaced people uh, and, and how this has to be addressed also in terms of access to water and, and sanitation. Any other comments on this question? Uh, may maybe a short one. I, I think it was this morning yet again when um, I think the Minister for Forestry and Water explained us that in, in Turkey, uh, I, I think he said 25% of the uh, displaced people actually live in, live in, um, in camps and, and, and, and roughly three thirds or so live in somewhere, you know, in cities. In, in Istanbul, 600,000 I learned this morning, amazing, you know. And also in, in many African countries and Asian countries, m many end up in, in, in slums. Um, I, again, I do not know the, the situation here in Istanbul, I do not want to comment on it, but, but globally uh, many live in densely populated, peri-urban, uh, neighborhoods, and these are the ones that also gr uh, grow at the moment the fastest. But many of these people have to pay for, for water. If you, if you upscale that to the cubic meter, it's much more than the people in the rich neighborhoods next door, you know, because they have to buy bottled water. And, and then if you add that up, it's maybe for, for a, a couple of cents per, per uh, or 50 cents or whatever for bottled water, but for people with very low 
purchasing power, that this is very expensive. And uh, the crystal clean drinking water supply coming from the pipe in, in, in other neighborhoods is overall much cheaper. So therefore, uh, leaving no one behind also has to do with water pricing. And I think cheap water at the end is very, busy, very expensive. So if we all pay a little bit more, that also enables us to, to, to provide better water services where, where children die because of diarrhea and all these issues. So, so really, we have to think about the concept of, of fair pricing and, and all contribute to, to these challenges. Any other questions at the moment? Danke. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah, maybe we have the same question. <laughs> well, I wanted to, co to comment uh, and more on the side of the monitoring. Uh, maybe you have more information, but for short-term refugees, for instance, in Mexico, many of the people that are migrants that are going to the United States stayed uh, some days, uh, weeks, months in this, uh, border, southern border of Mexico, and then they move through all the uh, country to the north. But in, there are no body monitoring these pe people. There is uh, any agency monitoring if they receive water, if they receive energy, if they, nobody will be monitoring that. That has an additional cost. The governments provide some service, but the monitoring will be an extra burden so how can we cattle, uh, tackle that issue? So how can we report that? How can, how can we track that? Maybe there is some experience here in Turkey and uh, you wish uh, to comment uh, on that. And also is uh, a, a who is paying what? You know, if somebody is paying much more for water or the people, uh, the children are getting sick, this is the people who are paying. It's not the government who is making the investment. So we need also to see who is paying for what and who is uh, uh, these trade-offs of economy uh, should be met. Uh, but maybe you have more experience on that and you can comment. And maybe I give the microphone to, okay, Jan, it's yours. Thank you. Do you want to answer first this question or shall I ask my, que my question? Okay, I can answer. Maybe you can also ask so we can combine Okay, <laughs> thank you. So I'm Jean Lapeg from uh, Action Against Hunger. It's an NGO. Uh, I wanted to come back to the issue of vulnerability because uh, SDG is a human rights uh, project. It's going to attain uh, everyone. But uh, the population has got uh, a big variability in terms of vulnerability. And I wanted to be sure that through the monitoring process, it will be possible to highlight uh, for the most vulnerable uh, part of the population of one country, maybe the poorest quintile, what is the level of access to water and sanitation services compared to the richest quintile, etc. So is this uh, issue of vulnerability monitoring uh, included in the framework? So do you have a person to address this question or just a general sentence? Uh, I don't know, I know that uh, OECD works by quintile of uh, poverty, you know, in some analysis, but uh, maybe it would be uh, also for uh, you and water. Okay. Yeltsin, can you take a few comments on that? Um, so maybe just to, to, to clarify, but I, I know, Jean, that you're well aware that the monitoring framework is a, is a UN uh, process. We as, as OECD are uh, contributing uh, as much as we can to this monitoring effort by providing data that we are already collecting on a number of indicators and processes. Um, so for now, the OECD is contributing to the, the monitoring of, of two targets, what concerns water, the one on local participation, uh, that I mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, the indicators that we that we are developing uh, are actually not looking at necessarily at uh, different uh, decile uh, of, of the population. Um, we're addressing the, the, the governance aspect uh, of, uh, of uh, implementing the, the SDG six uh, by looking at, at basically three uh, three aspects. One, on what for what concerns stakeholder engagement is whether there are there are in place. Uh, 
legal frameworks or formal uh, requirements uh, within a country and at different levels to engage stakeholders. The second is whether there is an agency or a platform that actually allows stakeholders to be part of this of, uh, of uh, uh, water policy making and implementation. And the, and the third one is whether there is an instrument in place uh, to uh, identify whether this is working well or not well and, and to try and develop some, some mechanisms to address uh, these gaps. The second target where the OECD is involved uh, is actually target 6.8 that has to do with uh, uh, ODA flows, so meaning uh, um, aid for uh, public development um, aid. And uh, this is a target that is uh, monitored by the uh, Development Assistance Committee of the OECD that has been doing for decades uh, an, a monitoring exercise where every year uh, we, we survey our, uh, our member countries uh, when it comes to their uh, uh, development aid activities uh, at different levels, so it also includes decentralized uh, cooperation projects. Uh, and this is the type of data that will be directly, uh, uh, that would be a contribution to the monitoring effort of the SDGs. And again, because these are processes that are already in place, that we're not developing per se for the SDGs, uh, there is no, um, plan to, uh, to adjust them so that we, we target more specifically uh, vulnerable uh, population. Plan for uh, Blanca as well. Teşekkür ederim. Eee ben e, hem sorularla bağlantılı hem hem de genel sizin sorduğunuz sorularla bağlantılı e, birkaç şey söylemek istiyorum. Gerçi sorularda da vardı bu. E, sürdürülebilir kalkınma gündemi oluşturulurken e, daha önceki ajandalardan ya da sürdürülebilir kalkınmayla ilgili ajandalardan en önemli fark e, adalet, hukukun üstünlüğü, e, barış e, konularına yapılan vurguydu. Aslında bunlar tesis edildiği zaman bizim e, bu tür e, konuları da e, tartışmıyor olacağımızı düşünüyorum ben. Yani e, birazcık e, Bunlar yoksullukla, eşitsizliklerle, hakların çiğnenmesiyle de alakalı e, sonuçlar. Yani kimse yoksa vatanını, evini, işini bırakıp başka bir ülkede yaşama e, yolunu seçmez. Özellikle zorunlu göçler için. E, o yüzden sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedeflerinin e, gerçekleştirilmesi için verilecek gayretlerin aslında e, göçmen, zorunlu göç sorununu da e, ortadan kaldırması ya da azaltması gibi bir iyi niyetim var. E, tabii e, sorulardan birisinde e, bu e, kırılgan gruplar, vulnerable group e, hatırlatması yapıldı. E, e, sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedeflerinde zaten en önemli vurgulardan bir tanesi bu hedefler aslında e, kırılgan gruplara ve en az gelişmiş ülkelere daha çok e, mesaj. Yani onları daha iyi duruma getirmek için e, gayret sarf edecek dünya e, ve ülkeler. E, bir de e, bu e, sabahki Sayın Bakan'ın konuşmasına ben de atıf yapmak istiyorum. Ben e, İstanbul'da 600 bin e, kiliste nüfusunun dört katı bir e, nüfus e, olduğu zaman yani bununla yerel yönetim e, nasıl başa çıkar, yerel yöneticiler bunu nasıl halleder gibi bir soruya düşünmek bile bana çok şey geliyor. Yani biraz yerel yönetimleri de çalışmış birisi olarak yani bir anda şehrinizde 600 bin kişi veya ilinizde e, dört katı nüfus hakikaten e, bu tek bir e, yönetimin yani bir belediye başkanının ya da bir valinin ya da bir bakanlığın üzerinden kalkabileceği bir durum değil. Çok arazi bir durumdan bahsediyoruz. Ben burada da gene sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefleri içinde yer alan e, ortaklıklara vurgu yapmak istiyorum. E, yani e, hiç kimse e, konunun dışında kalmayacak. No one e, will be left e, behind diyor SDG'ler. E, burada ortaklıklarla sorununu çözmek gerekiyor. Yani belediye başkanını yalnız bırakmamak gerekiyor. Veya bir bakanlığı tek başına sen bu işin sorumlususun hallet. Veya bir ülkeyi tek başına bu senin e, ülkene geldi, sen e, ne yapıyorsan yap değil. E, burada tüm taraflarla, uluslararası kuruluşlar, sivil toplum örgütleri, özel sektör, yani e, 
belki e, istihdam kotalarında e, mültecilere e, yer ayırabilirler, e, eğitimde e, özel durumlar yaratılabilir, su en zoru, su içti mi içmedi mi bunu kontrol etmek e, e, çok zor bir şey, izlemesi çok zor bir şey. Evet kapıda göçmenlerle, mültecilerle ilgili bütün bilgileri alıyoruz. E, Kamplarda olanların e, yaşam standardı için e, çok ciddi önlemler alınıyor ama e, diğer illere dağılanların e, ne yaptıklarını, nasıl yaşadıklarını kısmen e, bilebiliyor yerel yöneticiler ama bunların böyle sistematik bir izlenmesi, ihtiyaçlarının tespiti, projelendirilmesi ve e, hem ulusal hem uluslararası kaynakların bunlara proje bazlı yönlendirilmesi e, benim hani mevcut e, projecilik deneyimimle e, imkansız bir şey. Dolayısıyla burada e, geliştirilecek ortaklıkların da her düzeyde e, çok iyi formüle edilmesi lazım. Yeni yöntemler oluşturulması lazım. Çünkü biz Türkiye olarak mevcut yöntemlerin, uluslararası işbirliği yöntemlerinin bu tür e, beklenmeyen zorunlu göç durumlarında e, biraz e, zayıf kaldığını e, birebir yaşadık diye söyleyebilirim. Bununla bağlantılı olarak ben direkt Cumali hocama devamını bunu sorayım. Biraz teknik olarak. Türkiye'de mültecileri misafir eden şehirlerimizin e, sorunlarını çözerken bu sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedeflerinin çizdiği çerçeve bize ne kadar yardım ediyor? Onları göz önünde nasıl bulunduruyoruz? Burada e, sabah Sayın Bakanımız da ifade ettiler. Ee, olumlu bir şey söylemek oldukça zor. Şimdi burada acil bir durum var. Ee, bombalama, bombalardan kaçan hızlı bir nüfus var. Birkaç gün içerisinde 100 bin kişi, 200 bin kişi, 500 bin kişi hareket halinde bir ülkeden bir ülkeye göçüyor. Şimdi ona hızlı bir şekilde e, müdahale etmek, onu daha doğrusu müdahale etmek derken onları... E, can güvenliği sağlayacak ve hayatlarını devam ettirebilecek bir ortam e, sağlamak gerekiyor. Bunu sağlayabilmek için e, öncelikle bir takım hızlı e, kararlar alınıyor ve hızla uygulanıyor. Bunu e, uygulama esnasında uluslararası kuruluşların aynı hızda davrandığını e, maalesef göremedik. Yani e, bu konuda e, aynı hızla bırakın davranmayı e, uzun vadede de çok yavaş kalıyorlar. E, gerek sadece ekonomik açıdan değil, teknik açıdan da, metodoloji açısından da o konuda beklediğimiz e, desteği ve yardımı gördüğümüzü söyleyemem. Burada şunu ifade etmek istiyorum. E, şimdi izleme konusu işin e, evet e, gerekli ama bundan önemlisi veri üretmek gerekiyor. Siz bir şeye karar verecekseniz elinizde veri olacak. Burada izleme ile ne kastediliyor bilmiyorum. Mevcut durumun tespiti ise Mevcut durumun tespiti bir şekilde yapılır. Örnek olarak e, işte kayıtlar vardır bir yerden bir yere geçenler. Veya bir yerde e, ani nüfus artışı varsa şehir içerisinde orada hızlı bir su tüketimi meydana geliyor demektir. E, şebekeye verilen su e, artışında fazla e, büyük bir sıçrama meydana geliyor demektir. E, kaçak su kullanımı artabilir. Yani bazı bir takım e, kestirimler yapmak mümkün. Başka tabi yerleşimle, iskanla ilgili veriler de temin edilebilir. Burada izleme ile ne kastedildiğini tam ortaya konulması gerekir. İzleme mevcut durum izlemesinden çok geleceği planlamak için veri üretmek olmalı. Yani şu andaki durum evet izleyelim ama bunun bir metodolojisi olacak. Daha sonra karar vermek için sistematik bir veri seti oluşturmalı. E, aksi takdirde izlemek sadece seyretmek e, e, den öteye geçemez. Benim özellikle bu hususu vurgulamak istediğim, e, e, ifade etmek istiyorum. E, bir de önemli olan e, husus şu. E, bir yerden bir yere göç var. O göç esnasında e, hızlı karar verecek Birleşmiş Milletler, uluslararası kuruluşların ve bu kararı uygulayacak mekanizmasının olması gerekiyor. Aksi takdirde Türkiye burada çok cesur davrandı veya aynı şekilde güneyde İran, e, affedersiniz İran dedim yanlış söyledim, Ürdün. 
e, Libnan bu ülkeler e, e, kabul ettiler. Ama tam tersi olabilir. E, sınıra duvar örüp hiç kimseyi de almayabilir. O zaman e, nasıl bir durum olacak? Orada bir meydana gelecek bir e, toplu ölüm hadisesi katliam tam bütün insanlık sorumlu olmayacak mı? Yani bunların e, uluslararası örgütler tarafından önceden planlanması e, ve acil müdahale yöntemlerinin geliştirilmesi gerektiğini düşünüyorum. Sadece su açısından değil, diğer e, güvenlik açısından, e, gıda temini açısından, yerleşim açısından, bütün ihtiyaçlar açısından e, hatta buna sebep olan faktörü ortadan kaldıracak mekanizmalar açısından da e, daha etkin e, hızlı karar veren e, mekanizmalara ihtiyaç olduğunu düşünüyorum. Teşekkür ederiz. Uh, some of the refugee hosting countries are already under water stress. And we are putting mass movement of people into these countries. So they are on the edge and they are also trying to host the uh, coming incoming refugees. What kind of tools, policies can be used to promote uh, efficient use of this water, uh, not to increase the stress on fragile water supplies? Yirki, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on this one. Okay, thank you. I think that uh, um, when you talk about scarcity and uh, maybe the countries, I think um, the previous panel, I think it's Jordan, who also mentioned that um, r now they're facing really water scarcity to deal with the, um, their citizen, but also um, the refugees which they are hosting and providing the same needs on water. Um, what could be done uh, in this case, and also in case of a scarce quantity, uh, scarcity, uh, facing scarce water uh, issue is really to try to uh, take into account non-conventional water. And taking into account non-conventional water, I think this region is also doing this very well, have uh, success stories on that, um, using desalinization, which is uh, somehow costly, but I know that uh, some regions are doing it. But more and more also uh, using uh, wastewater, treated wastewater for um, many of um, um, irrigation, but also other type which uh, uh, wastewater can be treated fit for purpose to leverage the fresh water for other users. And um, here again, I might say that uh, this region, particularly Jordan, Israel, other countries, even Turkey, are doing very well in terms of uh, reusing uh, uh, water. Reusing water when uh, it, comes, it comes with uh, uh, technology to treat, with, to treat this water, but technology is really out, of the, out there. I think uh, even the previous uh, speakers has really mentioned it. What needs to be done is to share these uh, technologies to adapt them at uh, the local level, because um, there are two types. Sometimes we all think about a big uh, centralized uh, treatment plant, which can be also used, because um, the case of Mar Morocco, for example, are using uh, treated wastewater for irrigation and, and using uh, solar energy to pump this on, in Wazazat, for example. But when it comes to the refugee scan, there are some uh, technology which can help us, uh, first of all, um, reduce the, the negative impact of um, the waste we are generating, mainly wastewater, but uh, adopt also the policies because and regulation. In some countries, the policies and regulation is not adopted. We have it for uh, water supply, fresh water, but when it comes to the use of wastewater, we need really to see what is the rule, what is the boundaries, and how we can really expand it. I, I can give some example uh, on, uh, there are this um, constraint of social acceptance, for example, which we need to deal with, 
if you are using uh, wastewater, what type of crop we are uh, producing, how are we harvesting it, and I think this also we have some regulation, uh, some standards which has been elaborated. We can also adapt from the WSO 2006 guidelines, which most of countries are using. But we need to, to see what is um, the multi-barrier approach we need, because when you are using wastewater, you need also to um, halt uh, the, the negative impact in terms of health, at in terms of which crop you are uh, producing, in terms of which kind of impact it can have, uh, it can have uh, in the environment, meaning uh, salinity of soils, um, the fact that this can be um, um, leaked, leaked into a shallow aqua aquifer. So you need some policies and guidelines to really make it reusable. But more and more, all, most of the countries is going toward this um, reusing wastewater because it's, a, it, it's a really a resource. And I, don't, I think that Stefan will, uh, can develop more. He has coordinated the 2007 uh, World Water Development Report, which was really on wastewater, this untapped resources. Untapped resources because, and they, we come up with four uh, approach. You need to kind of reduce the amount of wastewater, reuse it, remove the, the pollutant in the wastewater, reuse this wastewater and recover the resources. And if you look at the wastewater, we have 99% of water. The rest is the pollutant. Which technology you can use to remove that? And if you remove that, remo remove it, what is the fit for purpose you want to do? Is it for irrigation? Is it for flushing toilets? Is it for greening areas? All the this, this, uh, options of management need to be done. And this approach can apply into these refugee camps on, uh, where we have water scarcity. There are uh, some approaches like the eco ecological sanitation, which has been used several, uh, elsewhere, where you can really separate already uh, the, the pollutant or the waste upstream and use it for uh, production. But all this has to be adapted in the context of uh, the country, the, the, the, the community, for their acceptance and trying to really uh, show that um, there are no harm because you have uh, used the best technology, you have uh, treated at the level that is really not impacting their life or impacting the environment in which they are, use, they are, they are living. So in summary, what I want to say is that um, when you are in uh, water scarcity, and water scarcity be, can be both sides, where you don't have it in terms of quantity, so you need to deal with what you have, but you, in the little wa fresh water you use, you produce wastewater. If you produce it and then you can treat it to reuse it, then at least you minimize the efficiency. This is one way. The other way also is combining the, um, the efficiency of wastewater. Sometimes in what we are using, we are really kind of wasting. Wasting in terms that um, it could be through the drainage, through uh, old infrastructure, you, if you look at the irrigation. And um, there are some technology like drip irrigation, which can be used even for the west, uh, using the treated uh, effluent. So it's a combination of right policies, tailored technologies, and then incentive for population to accept it. And then for investment also from the government, not only the government, but making the case that the private sector can come in and help the government. Because when we said government, when the private sector see that they can leverage some business case out of it, they can come in and help develop and address the situation. I can stop here. Uh, thank you very much bringing the issue of uh, water and waste water management all together. So when we're talking about water management, uh, also in the applying of SDGs, we have to think about in an integrated manner together with wastewater. And in a way, we should also remember, always remember that all the water we use is somehow recycled water. Call it reuse or not, but we are using the same water. 
we know that in your uh, World War II geography report, you will hear about it uh, tomorrow uh, more. Actually, I have an, another question for you at this mo moment. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about now post-war time, post-war zones. What will happen to these uh, people? Hopefully, they will return back to their uh, countries in a short period of time. And when they return back, how can the international uh, platform can help them to implement these uh, SDGs to help them build their countries again? Question for me? Yeah. Uh, thank you. I was preparing a beautiful speech on the World Water Development Report, but I enjoyed Bugur's summary very much. So it was yeah, you can also very talk about it. <laughs> to, to answer your question, well, <laughs> post-war zones is certainly a, a, a big challenge. Um, maybe it links a little bit to, to what the, the a colleague from Turkey and also the, the gentleman from the audience uh, said about uh, monitoring of vulnerability, because uh, I, I think also in, in this vulnerable areas, like a post-war um, situation, uh, we, we need to understand what's going on on the ground. And certainly, uh, as the, the colleague from Turkey said, it, monitoring is not for the sake of monitoring, obviously not. It's trying to understand the real situation on the ground. How do we do this in the, in the light of the SDG? That's your question. You know, we have 17 goals, 169 targets, uh, 230 plus indicators. And some people say, oh, that's far too complicated, far too many. I argue the other way around. If you really want to understand what's happening on the ground, you don't believe that th you understand the water situation in the country and the whole world by measuring 11 indicators. These are the 11 indicators. Now, what, what, now I come to your question. Um, what, what we need to understand is also how, how is that disaggregated for different members of society? How ca can we disaggregate the data for, for men and women, you know, the gender component, for the migration status, for the um, country of origin, for the ethnicity maybe, or, or, or part of a religious group, or you know, really try to disaggregate societal data as much as we can. So actually, on top of all these indicators, we have to monitor even more. And again, not for the sake of monitoring, but for the sake of understanding the situation better. And if we understand the situation better, that also helps us to assess the current policy framework, or if not sufficient, maybe come up with solutions to, to improve, make it better and then implement action. So not, not for the sake of monitoring, we're really now understanding, assessing the, the, the policy framework and then trying to, trying to change, make it better. Um, yeah, pro probably in that, that applies probably to all countries particularly, but, but to vulnerable uh, countries like post-war situation. And, and my, my last comment on, the, on, on this very uh, difficult, uh, because you asked me about post-war, it's not a question of technology, as Bigor already um, uh, explained to us. It's uh, first is probably political will to, to make a difference there. And even if that is there, then, then it, it always needs some sort of investment. I assume in your post-war situation, you asked me, uh, it, it needs massive investment to, to create the, uh, an applicable, an, uh, satisfying water supply and sanitation situation and, and to, to have that investment it needs stability it needs some some sort of, of reliable governance and rules and regulations that that have a climate and an enabling environment that allow these type of investments including not only a donation but also kind of a payback system a kind of an economic model that comes with it so so, so these are um, these are circumstances that the uh, that need to be created and, and that's much more than than only pouring money into a situation huh? it, it, it's uh, it's the whole system that, that need to be, uh, or have the capacity to actually uh, make the change. And th that's largely not only a question of funds, it's largely a question of, of, of governance and stability. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I want to turn to our audience. I know everybody is tired at the end of the day, but any contributions to what we have discussed, comments or questions? not if the panel has questions to the other panelists. Ah, sorry. Hanife Avcı, Çölleşme ve Özgürlüğü Mücadele Genel Müdürü. Ben özellikle konuşmacılara teşekkür ediyorum. Sürdürülebilir kalkınma ile ilgili bir yorum ilave etmek istiyorum. 
Birleşmiş Milletler Sürdürülür ve Kalkınma 2030 hedefleriyle alakalı olarak zaten ülkeler hedeflerini belirleyecekler. Ve tabi izleme üzerinde biraz e, istifade de yoğunlaşıyor ama uygulama da var aslında. Şimdi önce hedefleri belirleyeceğiz. İşte bu hedeflere nasıl ulaşacağız? Ulaşmak için araçlar gerekiyor. Ve belirlenen hedeflere ulaş ulaşmadığımızı ve gidişen yolu izlememiz icap ediyor. Tabi izleme erken uyar için bir şarttır gereklidir. Ancak sülevli kalkınma anlamında sizin hedefe ulaşmanız için önce bir hedeflerinizi belirlememiz gerekiyor. Tabi burada biz genel müdürlük olarak koordine ettiğimiz çözleşmeli mücadele sözleşmesi ve land degradation neutrality konusunu çalışan bir grubuz. Ve Türkiye olarak biz eldeyen hedeflerimizi 2013 hedeflerimizi belirledik. Bununla ilgili usul raporumuzu hazırladık ve Birleşmiş Milletler'e sunduk şu anda. Ve bununla ilgili de şu anda bu hedeflere ulaşılması konusundaki çalışmalarımızı yürütüyoruz e, Türkiye olarak. Ve bu konuda da önce ülkelerden bir tanesi çünkü örnek ülkeyiz bu konuda, çalışan ülkeyiz. Ve eldeyen konusundaki zaten e, özellikle arazi bozulumun dengelenmesinde su önemli bir faktör. Özellikle sulama faaliyetleri çok önemli bir faktör. Çünkü bununla ilgili en büyük faktör de zaten insan faaliyetlerinden kaynaklanan arazi bozulumu, ekosistem bozulumu çok önemli bir faktör. Bunun için de mutlaka sizin sulama yatırımlarına çok öncelik vermeniz icap ediyor. Sabahtan beri konuşmacılar da bahsettiler, değişik şeyde konuşma bahsedildi. Çünkü su aslında e, e, Sayın Ulan Buruk da bahsetmişti. Bir ve on veren, diğer sektörler ekli diyen çok önemli bir faaliyet, su faaliyeti. Kısal kalkınmada biz köylere gittiğimiz zaman köylüler bize şunu söylüyorlar. Bize su getirin başka hiçbir şey istemeyiz diyorlar. Onun için su çok önemli bir yatırım ve çok katma değer üretebilecek ve her sektörü ile etkileyen bir faktör. Bu açıdan aslında suyun beğenme önceliklerinde de öne geçmesi gerekiyor bu bütün sorunların çözümünde. Ben burada bir katkı vermek istiyorum ve teşekkür ediyorum konuşmacılara. Thank you very much for this uh, contribution. Selma Hanım. Sorulara geçmeden önce bir ekleme yapmak istiyorum. Bu savaş veya kargaşa dönemleri sonrasındaki yeniden yapılanmalarla ilgili. E, tabii savaş kötü bir şey ve maalesef ekolojik e, sistemler üzerine kötü izler de bırakabilir. Yani e, bu, e, bu da e, yeniden yapılandırma döneminde bence sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefleri ve suyla ilgili hedefler açısından dikkate alınması gereken bir nokta. Ee, bozulan ekolojiler olacaktır, su ekosistemleri olabilecektir ve bunların rehabilitasyonu e, sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefleri arasında bozulan ekosistemlerin rehabilitasyonu konusu yer almaktadır. Ee, tabii hiç böyle bir şey istemeyiz ama yani bu da e, aslında e, bu tür e, problemli dönemler, kargaşa dönemleri geçtikten sonra sadece su temini veya suyun kullanıcıya iletilmesi değil, aslında kaynak üzerinde yaratılan tahribatı da bir şekilde gözetmek zorunda kalacaktır ülkeler. Bunu eklemek istedim benim bu sorunuza. Thank you very much. Before closing the panel, can I ask your recommendations for implementing the SDGs for the countries? What should we do for future? Very shortly, until and we will close. Katie. <coughs> Difficult question, uh, Ashley Ann, because uh, each country is specific, but I think uh, the recommendation is um, already to, as uh, the, um, the Honorable um, our audience uh, said that, um, looking at what is the specificity, what is the goal the countries can achieve, and then working toward it. Using the existing framework, uh, we know that from the MDGs we have, most of the countries develop the, the integrated water resources management plan. Mm -hmm. You have uh, developed like uh, the plan uh, for um, climate adaptation, you have uh, the country, uh, the national development plan for the countries. Now looking at the SDGs and seeing, revi re reviewing all this existing plan with uh, what, with, with in the lens of the sustainable, uh, the sustainable development goal and see where the effort need to be 
uh, Putin, and then where the synergy and alliance could be built mm -hmm. and bringing it together, like looking at it not just we need to work, this has to work on uh, SDG 6, this is uh, for SDG 5, this, but looking it at a kind of holistic way um, on what you have and what you can bring and uh, implement them. Implementing them in the fact that it's not only the, um, the, the duty of the government, um, ministries, uh, institutions, but all stakeholders from the community level, what can be done, private, involve, private sector involvement, and uh, building on the skills and what everyone can bring as uh, you are building a, a wall, everyone bring his brick. So it's us, I'm seeing it as um, this way we could at least say that we are moving forward. Where capacity building needs to be done, this has also to be done to really uh, have the tools, have the capacity, and work together to our, uh, strengthening the existing institution and uh, tools to, uh, to get there. Yeah. Thank you. Stefan, final remarks? Probably two things. First, capacity building, that is absolutely critical. The, Roughly most of the country know their uh, development objectives, but to really be able to, to absorb, you know, the latest technology, the latest monitoring techniques and, and all this, you need to have the necessary capacity, and that requires capacity building through all the levels, you know, for, from maybe secondary school, maybe, maybe primary school, up to, you know, um, up to the minister. You know. <laughs> so, you know, really across all levels, capacity building is the first, and uh, probably the second is communication, you know, yet again. <laughs> because it's, it's, uh, it, it is very, very central and important. Thank you. Delphine? I think the, the, the challenges for the future is, in my opinion, threefold. Um, I think, first, we must pay attention to the issue of governance, and this has been mentioned throughout the, the panel, but I think um, integrating the SDGs into their, their strategies uh, is, is a, a challenge big enough for countries, but if at the same time they have to deal with a fragmented institutional setting where it's not clear who does what, uh, if the capacities are, are not in place, uh, if information is not shared efficiently, if uh, policies are, are uh, dealt with in silo uh, approaches, uh, if uh, stakeholders are not engaged, all these challenges have to do with, with governance. And this is one of the reasons why the OECD developed uh, a, a framework of reference or, or what we can consider standards on water governance that reflect the, the OECD principles on water governance. And they basically bring together the 12 key dimensions uh, of, of governance that address the different challenges that I've mentioned and that um, we believe can be also a, a useful um, uh, roadmap for countries when it comes to implementing the SDGs and particularly SDG 6 uh, to know whether their, their governance framework uh, in place is actually uh, fit to, uh, to address the, the issue raised by, by the SDGs. Um, I think the second uh, aspect of, of the challenges ahead has to do with financing I've, and we've, we've talked a little about it but, um, but I think, in my opinion, the, it's not a, a matter of, uh, of uh, raising funds. I think uh, money is there. I think that the challenge is actually how we can tap into it uh, and how this money can be uh, di directed to, to countries, uh, uh, to, sorry, to projects where it makes the most uh, value, um, but also how we can think about diversi diversifying the, the sources of revenues and, and uh, and coming up with, with new sources of finance um, and uh, the, to help uh, countries address these issues and how they can uh, reach out to, uh, to financiers, uh, how they can make uh, projects that are uh, bankable. Uh, we set up uh, what we call the round table on financing water and basically it brings together uh, uh, the, the, the water sector and, and, and government and author national authorities dealing with water with uh, the finance communities. And the idea is that the, the two of them can, uh, can discuss and, and uh, try to develop ways of overcoming uh, the, this gap uh, in, in, in how one can tap into the resources of, of the other. Um, and then my final message would be on the fact that in, in general, the question of implementing the SDGs is, uh, is a question of cooperation and it's a shared responsibility. 
And I think you said it very well, it's a shared responsibility across stakeholders, uh, but also, as I mentioned, across uh, levels of government. And so we have to encourage uh, greater coordination uh, and, and support between, uh, between the, all these different actors. Thank you very much. Sema Hanım, sizin de son görüşlerinizi, tavsiyelerinizi alalım. Teşekkür ederim. Ee, şimdi sürdürülebilir kalkınma hedefleri her ülkenin e, kendi üstüne göre bir elbise değil. E, bu bir küresel gündem ve her ülkenin oturup kendi e, gündemini e, önceliklendirmesi, e, zamanlamasını, kurgulaması ve oluşturması gerekiyor. Araçlarını tespit etmesi gerekiyor. Ee, biz bir egzersiz, bir uzman çalışması yaptık. Ben bir kopya buraya getirdim. Arzu edenlere hem e, basılı hem de e, elektronik versiyonunu e, paylaşabiliriz. Türkiye için bir önceliklendirme yaptık 169 hedef üzerinden. E, şunu söyleyeyim, su öncelikli yani ilk e, dört öncelikli hedef arasında çıktı. Bu her bir e, 169 hedef bazında yaptığımız çalışmada. Tabii bunun, bu resmi bir çalışma değil, bir uzman çalışması. Resmi çalışması da yapılıyor e, Türkiye'de. E, yani kendi ulusal sürdürülebilir kalkınma gündemimizi belirlemek üzere çalışma yapılıyor. Su mevzuna geldiğimiz zaman e, konuşmacılar bahsetti. E, suyu veya enerjiyi veya yoksulluğu artık tek başına bakmamak gerekiyor. Bu gündemde e, bütün hedefler arasındaki etkileşimleri çalışmak gerekiyor. Suya ben suya da biraz baktım forum öncesinde. Su özellikle sürdürülebilir üretim tüketim, e, insan yerleşmeleri, yerleşmeler ve ekosistemlerle çok yoğun etkileşimli bir konu. Yani birisini gerçekleştirdiğiniz veya gerçekleştirmediğiniz zaman başka hedeflerdeki başarı ve başarısızlık düzeyinizde değişebilecektir. E, çok e, vurgulandı. Onu ben de vurgulamak istiyorum. E, bu iş e, hiç kimsenin tek başına altından kalkabileceği bir gündem değil. E, konuştuğumuz sorunların hiçbiri değil. Yani mülteci sorunu da hakeza öyle. E, bunda güçlü ortaklıklar lazım. Ortakların geç kalmaması lazım. E, buradaki uluslararası işbirliklerindeki e, yöntemlerin ve süreçlerin daha pratikleştirilmesi lazım. Yani mevcut bürokrasilerle gidildiği zaman e, şey e, o destek e, pansuman oluyor yani ilaç olmuyor. O yüzden e, yeni e, şeyler de tanımlanması lazım. İnşallah e, suların temiz olduğu, e, barışın bol olduğu bir dünya olur 2030'da. Bugünün çocukları da çok güzel bir dünya görür diye ben bitiriyorum. Teşekkür ederim. Umarız ki size katılıyoruz dileklerinize. Cuma Ali Hocam sizin evet, son görüşlerinizi de, kısaca e, hızlı alalım. Hızlı bir şekilde süre geçti doldu biliyorum. E, hemen toparlamak istiyorum. Başta birinci konuşmamda e, birinci önerimi söylemiştim. Bu fon mutlak surette oluşturulması gerekiyor. Acil e, e, eylemler için ve göçün önlenmesi için eğer biz bundan kaçınırsak bunun bedelini daha fazla öderiz. Sınırlara duvar örmekle veya herhangi engeller koyarak göçü önleyemeyiz. Bunun bedeli çok ağır olur. Bunun öde, bu bedelle karşılaşmamak için bu fonun mutlak surette oluşturulması, öncelikle uluslararası kuruluşlarında sadece bölgesel değil, havuz ölçekli çalışmaları gerekiyor. Havuz ölçekli bu fonu da kullanarak her bir havzada su potansiyeli nedir? Bu su potansiyeli hangi e, sektörlere hangi şekilde dağıtılmalı bunların belirlenmesi gerekiyor ne kadar içme suyu sektörüne e, dağıtılacak ekolojik hayat için ne kadar su gerekli sulama ne kadar sulamada kullanılabilir enerji de, ne, üretimi ne kadar olabilir burada e, diğer e, ana sektörlerde neler yapılar su ürünleri yetiştiriciliği gibi bunlar her bir havza için tek tek belirlenir biz Türkiye için bunu yapmaya başladık bu diğer bütün e, ülke, dünyadaki bütün havzalar için yapılması gerekiyor. E, bir diğer e, husus e, kısmen değinildi. E, bizim kriz yönetimini bırakmamız gerekiyor. Artık risk yönetimine geçmemiz gerekiyor. Bunun için 2100 yılına kadar iklim projeksiyonları var. Değişik senaryolara göre iklim e, senaryolarına e, e, uygulayarak e, kurak dönemleri, yağışlı dönemleri belirlemek gerekiyor. En şiddetli yağış döneminde debi nedir ona göre taşkın yönetimi en kurak dönemlerde 
e, su potansiyeli hangi değere iniyor? İhtiyaçlar arasında bu mevcut potansiyel nasıl dağıtılacak? Bunların e, önceden planlar halinde ortaya konulması gerek. Yani bu risk yönetimine geçmediğimiz sürece e, kriz yönetiminde de hiçbir zaman başarılı olamayız. E, hızlı e, hareket etsek ne kadar hızlı hareket etsek ne kadar ekonomik gücümüz olsa da krizi yönetemeyiz. E, bunun dışında e, aslında en önemli söyleyeceğim konulardan birisi verimlilik. E, su ihtiyacı herkes söylüyor. Her ülke e, bir su ihtiyacından bahsediyor. Ancak suyu ne kadar verimli kullanıyor? Bunu mutlak surette ortaya konulması gerekiyor. Suyu verimli kullanmadığımız sürece su e, ülkeler arasında da bir sorun olmaya devam edecektir. Su kıtlığı da sürekli olarak e, sürmeye devam edecektir. E, bunları vurgulamak demiştim. Birkaç konu var ama süre dolduğu için e, burada kesmek istiyorum. Thank you very much. I want to thank our audience for staying with us. And I invite you to join me to congratulate our panel. And we are hoping to see you tomorrow morning. Have a good night.